Uh, Dr. Mark Mazzola is going to, to speak to us. Dr. Mazzola is a research plant pathologist with the USDA ARS Tree Fruit Research Laboratory in Wenatchee. He was awarded the Lee Hutchins Award and elected a fellow of the American Phytopathological Society for his development of biologically based disease control methods and for clarifying the underlying mechanisms responsible for disease suppression. His current research focuses on understanding how biotic and abiotic environmental factors affect the structure and function of rhizosphere microbial communities and their impact on plant health. Please welcome Mark. Thank you, David. And thanks for sticking around for three days. You guys, man, persistent. Um, so I'm going to talk more from the perspective of the microbes rather than the roots and their interaction. You've heard a lot about the physiology and function of roots, and certainly the microbes of that system have a large role in the functionality of those roots, whether it be in the form of uh, nutrient uptake or actually uh, root development. So we're looking at functional roles of, of soil microbiology in, in, in my work, and certainly we're looking at a, a very uh, diverse consortia of organisms which associate with, with plant roots, whether they be protozoa, nematodes, bacteria, fungi, oomycetes, the list goes on and on. So we've looked at, at, at three different main points with regards to how microbes function to interact with plant roots, either positively or negatively. Certainly in the realm of, of root development, we're looking at how microbes might actually enhance root development. Uh, nutrient cycling and looking at how we might manage those microbial communities to more efficiently utilize uh, the inputs into the orchard system. And lastly, how we might manage the micro, mi microbiota in order to uh, limit uh, pathogen activity or reinfestation of a soil community. Um, today, I'm just going to uh, focus on, excuse me, two aspects, that being um, root development and, and disease suppression. So as someone mentioned in the question, soil health, the fact is, is that I think every commodity group that I talk to, uh, soil health is at the top of the list of their want for knowledge. Um, but I would argue getting a, a clear definition of soil health really depends upon uh, what attribute of the system you're looking to enhance, right? And, and typically when, we're talk, when people have talked about soil health or investigated soil health from a biological standpoint, they focused on the bulk soil. Well, the question is, is that the appropriate place to be? Is the bulk soil interacting with the plant, particularly from a plant-microbe interaction? When it comes to plant health, does the plant really give a darn about what's in the bulk soil, particularly from a microbiological perspective? And that's the question that uh, you might want to consider when you obtain information uh, with regards to your soil, quote unquote, health. So the, the root system or the rhizosphere soil and the bulk soil are microbiologically very different, okay? They're different niches, right? If, if you look at um, the composition of carbon that's available in these two different systems, they vary quite considerably. And so you're going to end up with microbial communities that are very different both in form and function. The bulk orchard soil, particularly in some of our uh, Columbia Basin orchard soils, you know, you're basically operating in a desert, you know, both from a, a, a soil type standpoint. Well, the organic matter of most of our orchard soils uh, is only one to three percent, four percent if you're perhaps if you're in an organic system, but only ten to twenty percent of that carbon is readily available. Right? Most of that carbon is recalcitrant, and so they're going to be very specific microbes that have the capacity to break that down, but the, the bulk of that soil community is not going to be able to utilize that carbon. And so only, only a fraction of that microbial life is actually active in the bulk soil community. In contrast, the rhizosphere has a very different complex of nutrient availability. It has a, a lot of uh, easily uh, metabolized carbon forms that microbes are saying, thank you for the tasty treat. And so the composition of the bulk soil community does not resemble the composition of the root associated microbial community. So just wanted to show you an example of that, and this is very old data, and so it's, it's, it's a, on a cultural based uh, community as far as the bacterial community that we're looking at, comparing the soil, the bulk soil community to the rhizosphere community. And this was in an orchard system that was one year old. 
If we look at the bulk soil community and what we, what we culture from that soil environment, we see that you know, basically everything's a bacillus, right? About 90% of the bacteria that we recover from that soil system are bacilli. A bacillus um, is a facultative oligotroph, and oligotrophs persist under chronic starvation conditions, right? So, but they may not persist when you actually give them something that, they, that the overall community desires. And so if we look in the rhizosphere, and again, that rhizosphere has a lot of little goodies that, that organisms like to, to, to munch on, we see a very different bacterial community that we recover simply on, on a cultural basis. And in fact, you see that bacilli in this instance represent only 3% of the overall bacterial community that we recover. And over here, it's 90%. So very different communities that we have in these two environments, and yet for the most part, um, when it comes to soil health, people have focused on this community, which is not interacting with the plant that you're interested in, that being the apple root system. Given that, the fact is, is that obviously the bulk soil microbial community serves as the seed bank for the rhizosphere microbial community. So given that, strategies to manage the rhizosphere microbial community may actually target either the bulk soil or the rhizosphere. So some of the strategies to direct that rhizosphere microbial community, and this is by no means a comprehensive list at all. One that was mentioned earlier is tillage. In fact, in, in, in annual cropping systems, this is a very uh, common practice to, to manage soil microbial communities, particularly from a, a plant disease management standpoint. You till some of that organic matter into the soil profile and you get uh, a, a much higher and elevated level of microbial activity and, and you end up with um, competition against pathogens that are residing in some of the substrate that's left over after the previous crop. Fertility management, and this was mentioned by, by Dave earlier, uh, the type of, of fertility input that, that, that you utilize is going to impact the ultimate microbial community. Plant-driven selection, I think that this is one that's gone um, underutilized under, uh, perhaps in some systems, and that is plant species is obviously going to have an impact on the final composition of that microbial community, but as some have alluded to, uh, it's not only plant species, but plant genotypes is going to impact what the composition of that community is. And finally, one that's commonly used, or probably the most easy to use in a system like an orchard, is amendment-based selection, whether it be compost, green manures, or, or bio-based waste products. So plant-driven selection. Again, the plant is going to select for a certain community based upon the composition of the exudates that that rhizosphere is releasing into the soil system. So the rhizosphere is specifically going to recruit and support different compositions of uh, soil microorganisms. So just looking at the effect of plant-specific root exudates on uh, the population of uh, fluorescent pseudomonads in, in a rhizosphere soil sample. Now, fluorescent pseudomonads from a, a plant microbe interaction uh, perspective are, are very well studied with regards to biological disease control. Um, many, of these, uh, organisms, many of these pseudomonads produce antibiotics, which have activity against a broad spectrum of plant pathogenic fungi. If we look at root, root exudates from, from wheat and root exudates from Apple and look at the capacity of those root exudates to actually support populations of a resident uh, fluorescent pseudomonad community. What we see is that there's obviously a, a, a lower log order of magnitude difference in the capacity of these exudates from these two plant species to support this community. You see that there's a little increase in uh, density in response to addition of apple root exudates relative to a, a minimal media but that, that difference does not sustain itself for any period of time. In contrast, if we add wheat root exudates to that soil system, you can see that there's a dramatic increase in the population of fluorescent pseudomonads, and that's maintained for a period of 30 days in this particular experiment. Well, again, it's not simply the plant species, it's also the plant genotype that's important in the capacity of these different, um, in the capacity of a plant to actually sustain a particular uh, community of microorganisms. In this instance, all we're looking at is growth of an organism, Pseudomonas fluorescence, which a particular isolate that's known to provide biological control of Rhizoctonia solani, which is a, pathogen, a root pathogen of wheat and a root pathogen of apple. And here we have two different wheat varieties, Hill 81 and Lujane. Okay, if you add root exudates from Hill 81, 
you basically get no increase in the support of this bacterium relative to a minimal media. If we add root exudates from lutein, you can see that there is a dramatic increase in the, in the density of this particular bacterial strain relative to root exudates from a different wheat cultivar. Well, why in the world would an orchardist care about that? Well, if we look at the capacity of a pre-crop of wheat to control Rhizoctonia root rot of apple that's planted into that soil, you can see that Hill 81, apple grown in, in, in soil that was cultivated with Hill 81, was just as diseased as apple which was grown without pre-wheat cropping in the presence of this pathogen. In contrast, if we had used that Lujane variety, we have significant control of the pathogen relative to the control. So genotype effects uh, go beyond just the capacity to support a community, but the functionality of that community with regards to disease suppression. Well, genotype effects also uh, have been documented in Apple, as both as Gennaro talked about, and the capacity of that, those, those different rootstocks to support specific microbial communities. So we've looked at that at, at the genetic level, using what is now called next-gen sequencing, where we basically amplify or look at all of the microorganisms that are present in the rhizosphere of Apple. And in this particular uh, protocol, we, we collect our sample, whoops, go back. We extract the DNA, we conduct the next-gen sequencing, which yields us so much data that we want to go home and cry because we don't know what to deal with it. The biggest problem in this system is actually trying to figure out how to analyze this data in a meaningful manner, which provides us with some direction, uh, enabling us to make some um, hypotheses, perhaps. So these, this slide just sh uh, shows you similarity in bacterial community amongst different samples based on uh, that next-gen sequencing data. So we're talking about millions of DNA sequences which are associated with a specific, specific organism. We look at the relationships of all of those sequences from one sample to another. And what we see here is that there are, are definitely um, soil effects on the bacterial community, the rhizosphere bacterial community. Here we have, you can see that all of the, back, all of the samples from one orchard soil are cluster, and all the samples from a different orchard soil cluster, but they're unique patterns, right? So all of the samples within one orchard soil are, are more similar to each other than the samples from a different orchard soil. So certainly there are soil effects on the community of bacteria that are colonizing the rhizosphere of apple. But there are also genotype effects, rootstock genotype effects on that same community. So in this instance, we have uh, one rootstock over here and another rootstock over here, as far as the bacterial community and their, their relatedness to one another. We see that the community from, from G210, all of those samples cluster together. All of the samples from M26 cluster together. Well, is this meaningful in any manner? Well, you might have heard of something called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It causes a disease called crown gall. And while it's not particularly recognized in our orchard soil systems, the fact is, is that I come across this more often than I'd care to mention. Um, whether or not it's actually limiting your productivity, that's not a question that I have addressed. But it certainly is a commonly residing organism in our orchards. Well, if we look at G210, we see that only less than 1% of the bacterial isolates that were detected by next-gen sequencing were actually Agrobacterium tumefaciens. If we look at M26, you see a six-fold increase in the percentage of um, bacteria which are identified by next-gen sequencing as Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So in that manner, here's another reason for perhaps looking at uh, the Geneva series rootstocks rather than the Malling series rootstocks. So what type of management effects do we have on our soil microbial communities? Well, certainly the tradition to maintain a weed-free strip is not exactly a fruitful environment for the microorganisms that we're trying to manage. The maintenance of that weed-free strip results in the lowest rate of root development and lower microbial activity, and probably one leads to the other. Chicken, egg, I don't know, but certainly manage, managing that strip in a, in a different fashion might 
result in a more uh, effective and functional soil microbial community. Just looking at, and, and I'm only mentioning this one because it's one that typically isn't recognized as important, perhaps, in most of our agricultural ecosystems, but looking at the effect of protozoa on, on root development. So we know that genotype is going to affect root development. We know that nutrition is going to affect root development. We know that mycorrhizal colonization is going to affect root development. There are a whole host of other organisms in that system which are going to impact root development. And one of them are, in fact, protozoa. If we look at um, the root, root development on an, uh, on an auger surface in the absence of protozoa, you can see that you're ending up with, in this instance, a bunch of uh, stubby roots. If you add something like Neglaria americana, this actually is a protist that's very common in the apple rhizosphere. If you add that to the system, you end up with much elongated uh, uh, and a more fibrous root system. So there are, are what is the function of this? What are, what are the mechanisms of this? Um, there have been many that have been offered, hypothesized, uh, everything from increased nitrogen availability to uh, production of plant hormones like IAA, um, I wouldn't say that there is a definitive uh, mechanism of action, and it could vary from protist to protist. Um, you might recognize the name Neglaria, Neglaria grubri. If you go to New Orleans, don't take a swim, because this is related to the brain-eating organism. Uh, so, you know, one or the other, get, get it down to the species level if you want to raise a concern. This one is not a concern in that regard. So how do we manage this resource? Right? So here's an, another photo of an, our Neglaria, and you can see a, a bunch of stuff hanging around here. Well, it's, this particular protist is a bacteriovorous protozoan. It eats bacteria. That's its food source. So one might argue that by increasing the population of bacteria, you'd increase the population of your protozoa. Basic predator-prey relationships. Add a deer, add a wolf, add a few more deer, add a few more wolves, right? Well, to influence the bacterial community, one of the easiest ways to do that is to uh, utilize uh, different forms of fertility inputs. Well, the type of fertility input that you utilize is going to alter the type of microbial community that you end up with. And so here we just have uh, a pseudomonad, and up here we have an actinomycete. Well, there actually are preferences amongst these predators as to who they're going to feed on. Well, and the glaria really likes to eat fluorescent pseudomonads, it can't eat these guys at all. It's like cauliflower as far as it's concerned. Okay, so you have to understand that these relationships are actually much more complex than we typically think about. And this is just, just one very simple interaction, um, which, you know, I don't mind because it's given me a career. But you guys really, I'm sure you mind. Any complexity, any more complexity, and I would just close my eyes. Um, so this is just to look at the effect of different uh, end inputs as far as bacterial numbers. Um, so we have compost, we have urea, and we have canola meal. And you can see that in this particular instance, canola, canola meal resulted in dramatically increased uh, bacterial densities. And if we look at um, Neglaria really liked that outcome. So this is the uh, population of Neglaria after the addition of canola meal. Um, we basically had about a two order of magnitude increase in the density of that particular protozoan. So again, we, we can use this information in a manner to, to modify those communities in a way that may benefit overall root development in the long run. So I'm going to change directions now and, and talk about building a more uh, resilient system uh, in, after a replant setting um, simply by uh, changing the dynamics of how we manage uh, replant disease. So typically, soil fumigation is the primary means by which that disease phenomenon is controlled. It works quite well. But we also know that these fumigated soils are rapidly recolonized by soil-borne pathogens. And how is that impacting overall orchard productivity over the longer term? So just to show you one example of, of how quickly 
one particular pathogen, Rhizoctonia solani, can recover uh, in a fumigated orchard system. This is just looking at percent root infection uh, over time, okay, over five years. So at the end of the first growing season, we're really not detecting that organism uh, from roots of apple, but you can see that there's a dramatic increase uh, over a very short period of time in the incidence of that particular pathogen. And so we've been looking at uh, a seed meal, a mustard seed meal approach to managing this disease, trying to build up a more resistant system to pathogen reinvasion. Uh, the seed meal that we're utilizing is actually a composite seed meal. It's a combination of uh, yellow mustard and white mustard, Brassica juncea and Sinapis alba. And so here we, we, we are looking at the increase in growth of Gala M9 um, in response to uh, soil fumigation in the red line, our control is in the blue line, and our seed meal is in the yellow line. And during that first growing season, you can see there's no difference between fumigation and uh, the seed meal. In fact, even almost up to year two, you start to see a separation, and thereafter that separation increases. Though I, I have to mention that there, statistically, there's no difference between the seed meal and the fumigation. Okay. If we look at yield, however, you can see that, that that seed meal treatment resulted in an increase in yields that was at about 23% relative to soil fumigation, which of course in this instance was better than the no treatment control. So that's Galo on M9. Uh, this is Galo on G11. We have about a 25% a, a increase in yields relative to the no treatment, con uh, excuse me, relative to soil fumigation, at least to the first two uh, harvest seasons. Well, why is this difference uh, being realized? And just going back to the pathology of the system. So lesion nematode, Pratolinchus penetrans, is a significant component of the pathogen complex that causes replant disease. If we look at the end of year one, the, first, the end of the first growing season, fumigation, these are densities, root densities. You can see that fumigation was very effective in reducing the overall density of that nematode relative to the no treatment control as was the seed meal treatment in the green bar. However, at the end of the second growing season, you can see that, in fact, that nematode recolonized that soil system uh, very quickly. And in fact, there's no difference in lesion nematode density between the fumigated treatment and the control treatment. And in fact, even after four years, the seed meal treatment is continuing to sustain a very low density of lesion nematode relative to the fumigation treatment. Similar results with regards to Pythium, another component of the replant disease complex. At the end of the first growing season, you can see that both the fumigation and the seed meal uh, treatment both significantly reduced root infection by Pythium species relative to the no treatment control. But again, that, that fumigation response was only one growing season in duration, whereas seed meal continued to suppress that particular pathogen. Well, from a biological perspective, what, what's going on here? What are the differences? And do they have anything to, deal, to do with the observation of resistance of that seed meal system to invasion by plant pathogens? So these are rhizosphere samples, rhizosphere soil samples collected at the end of the second growing season. And in this instance, we're going to look at the fungal community. And this is just a plot, again, of relatedness amongst samples as far as their fungal composition, and this again was done using next-gen sequencing. And what you can see is that after the second year, second growing season, the fungal community and the no treatment control and the fumigated soil system were identical. You can't separate the two. They're indistinguishable from each other. In contrast, if you use, look at the seed meal system, you can see that it is distinct from the control or the fumigated treatment. It's composed of a, a, a very different fungal community. There are some interesting components of that fungal community from the seed meal system, which were not found in the control or the fumigated soil system. They include things like the nematode trapping fungus. It's a parasite of plant parasitic nematodes. There is a Dactylella over parasitica, which is a parasite of uh, nematode eggs. Things like enhanced numbers of predatory nematodes in that seed meal system and the occurrence of this guy, Odiodendron, an organism I'd never heard of before. It's a fungus which actually uh, provides control of things like Phytophthora and Pythium. 
So there's some distinct differences in uh, the community that's contained within that seed meal amended soil system, which at least are associated with the disease outcomes that we see. Uh, we also looked at the bacterial community, and again, the same thing. After two years, there's no difference between the control and the fumigated system, whereas that seed meal system is clearly distinct from a compositional standpoint than the control of the fumigated system. Perhaps off message here, but one thing that was really interested in that seed meal system is that you end up with a lot of bacteria that can degrade pesticides. So maybe you have a bioremediation uh, tactic, uh, perhaps, in your orchard system, as well as a disease control tactic. These things uh, really like to chew on very complex recalcitrant chemistries. Um, just a thought. One thing that's, that, that was kind of uh, opposes some of the dogma from an ecological standpoint is that the rhizosphere microbial community in the seed meal amended system is actually much less diverse than that in the control of the fumigated system. This is just a, a diversity index, and this had to do with bacteria, and you can see that seed meal system is significantly less diverse than either the control or the fumigation system. Same was true from the fungal community. If we look at the number of fungal species that were identified in the rhizosphere of apple in these soil systems, again, the seed meal system harbored a much uh, less robust community of fungi. So it's Again, just contrary to conventional wisdom, the resistance system was less diverse. Dave said, give a few take-home messages. Sure. When it comes to soil health, look to the rhizosphere. Okay? Look to the rhizosphere. That bulk soil system is probably not going to tell you too much, particularly when it comes to link linkage of microbial community to overall plant performance. I think, and this has been stated by others t this morning, is that plant genotype can be a really powerful tool in managing rhizosphere microbiology. Pick your root stock carefully. And lastly, system resistance. It's more about function. In this particular instance, it's more about function than it is about diversity. Thanks. Okay, <clears throat> we have time for questions. Have you done work with just mustard cover crops growing um, after orchards are planted out or before the new ones planted? Just... Before the new ones are planted in. Yeah. Um, there's, again, the seed meal itself, the chemical composition of that seed meal beyond what are known as, quote unquote, the biofumigant chemistries. The chemistry of the seed meal itself is selecting for a microbial community that uh, has capacity to do things um, which you're not going to obtain if you use mustards as a cover crop. We, we did actually try mustards as, ever, as a cover crop. In fact, we used cover crop up to three years and saw no effect with regards to disease suppression. The amount of glucosinolate that's contained within the leaf or root tissue relative to the seed meal is basically inconsequential as far as the amount of chemistry that you're going to generate from a purely chemical standpoint for disease control. So that's not the direction that I think from a time perspective or an efficacy perspective is the way to go. Well, while we're on cover crops, any other cover crop work you've done, sedan grasses, rise? Probably. No, the cover crop work that, that I was doing was specifically related to how wheat can modify microbial community. And it's, it's only, I think most people tend to think of wheat as, okay, we grow the wheat and we plow it in. No, this is, this is root system driven selection. So we actually would remove the green matter from that system. We never incorporate it. And the reason why is because that green matter actually, it increases populations of things like pythium. So that, and that's a significant component of the disease that we're trying to control. Okay, I've got several texts that have come in. Um, where do we get mustard seed meal and what, what are the rates? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't provide commercial inputs. Uh, there are, there, there's a couple of companies and I'm, I think, you know, uh, Geraldine's article lists one of them. I don't want to mention names, but 
they're out there. And the rates, we're t actually, we're, we're, we're looking at right now is inter integrating rootstock seed meal combinations to look at how low we can go as far as the rates are concerned. Uh, right now, we're using two to three tons per acre. And upfront cost, it's certainly more expensive than fumigation, but I think if the yield responses that we've seen uh, hold out, um, I think it's a cost-effective approach over the long term. Okay. Uh, question, should we apply uh, the meal amendments to new plantings? That's a really good question. Uh, in, in some systems, what we're looking at is even in a fumigated soil system, can we augment the biological resistance of a fumigated soil system through the use of a, a seed meal application? And, and those are ongoing studies. I think, um, I guess that's the relevance I have. Okay, these are related questions. How are you handling the application of the seed meal? What equipment and depth of application? The, the, the commercial product is pelletized, so I think there are, there's equipment out there that should be able to, to move that material through the orchard system. Um, unfortunately, from a research perspective, we don't have the optimal equipment to actually incorporate the material. So, uh, you know, we've got a rotavator, and that's as deep as we can get it, uh, which is, in my, from my perspective, it's, it, it's not the optimal system. I mean, if we could get this stuff down 12, 13 inches, um, I would think we'd, we'd be really be uh, improving the system because we were at a depth of six inches. Okay, another question is, what tools do we have on the farm to evaluate soil health of the rhizosphere? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. it, again, <clears throat> even, even just sampling, you know, you often, I, I, you often get differences in what uh, someone, individual, considers to be rhizosphere soil. You know, we consider rhizosphere soil that soil which is directly impacted by the root exudation process. Um, it's the impact of that rhizosphere is going to differ, or the, excuse me, the, the length of that rhizosphere is going to differ based upon, you know, things like water content, you know, diffusible, diffusibility of carbon uh, through that soil environment. I, you know, it, 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 to my knowledge, there aren't a lot of tools that you have available that would enable you to, to characterize that system very effectively. But next-gen sequencing costs are coming down. <laughs> Other questions from the audience here? Okay, I think we'll, <clears throat> let's give Mark a round of applause and then we'll bring up our speakers.